In this video, I'm going to be showing you how to build 3D isometric text inside Adobe Illustrator, just like the example you see right here. So a few things as we get started here, you're going to want to make sure that you have your properties window open. It's going to be very helpful for doing this. So just go to window and then properties about two thirds of the way down. If there's not a check mark next to it, just click it. It'll show up. If there is, it's somewhere on your screen. So you just have to find it. And you'll also want to turn on smart guides. They're just super helpful for knowing where in the text you are selecting. So go to view and then about two thirds of the way down in this one as well. Make sure smart guides is checked. If not, just check it. And the font I'm going to use to do this is Montserrat, but you can feel free to use whatever font or whatever object you want. This works just the same on objects, but I will place a link in the description to download this font in case you want to copy what I'm doing quite exactly. So with that being said, let's just get going. So just have your text ready to go or your object ready to go that you want to make 3D. And also in the properties window, when you have your text selected by using the black arrow, which is called the selection tool, you also can go to tracking, which looks like a VA with a line pointing left and right. If you wanna make your text space out just a little bit more so there's a bit more breathing room, you can make that a bigger number, something like 50 or 75, totally up to you. I find for the example that I made, it helped make things look just a little bit better. And from this point, what I like to do is with that selection tool is just to hold alt on a PC or option on a Mac, click, hold and drag that text down to make a copy. So your original text is saved in a non edited form. And from this point, we want to actually apply the 3d effect using the built in 3d tool in illustrator to do that in the properties window, you can just hit the FX button in the appearance section of the window. And from here you can select 3d. And then from 3D, you can select extrude and bevel, which will bring up the extrude and bevel 3D portion of the tool. So a few things to consider here. The first is the surface, which is how it's rendering the text. We're going to want to do this in the final stage with no shading. But as far as deciding what your actual text looks like, selecting wireframe is very, very helpful. So I'm just going to move this box around a little bit so we can see our type here. And also just make sure in the lower left hand corner that preview is checked so you can see what we're actually up to here. But what I'd like to do is in these three different axes that this is rotated on, I just highlight over each one and enter zero. So that will make us start on a starting point with actually no 3D rotation yet. And then you can either enter in numbers here or you can just adjust these with the little dials. You can also alternatively grab this box and move it on your own, which is a faster way of working, but it's just a little bit less precise. It can be hard not to unintentionally do some sideways rotation. So up to you how you want to do it. But what I personally like to do is just adjust this very top one, which is around the X axis. So you can kind of decide what number looks good to you. But in the examples I made, I didn't have any rotation on this one, which is the Y axis or any rotation on this one, which is the Z axis. But if you want to do that, it works totally the same. So you can play around and get this looking a way that you want. And of course, if you want to reset it, just type in zero, click in a different box and you'll see what that looks like. The only other real options to consider here for replicating what I did are the extra depth, which is 50 point by default, at least on my particular machine, but you can make this much, much bigger if you want to. And that's just the amount of depth that the 3d extrude will have. So I will just type in 50 and then go back to clicking a different box and that'll adjust that back to where we started. And then there is also bevel. So by default, there is no bevel, but especially when you click in the wireframe, you can start to see some different bevel effects. So you can play around with these different bevels to get a look that you like. Just be very aware that the complexity of the 3D extrude becomes much, much greater as you select some different bevels. So the bevel in the example of the thumbnail of this video I used was the classic bevel, which adds a cool look to it without making this be way too complex. So that is the bevel that I'm going to use for this particular example. And you can also adjust the height of that particular bevel. So feel free to do that. Once again, things can get really, really complex, really, really fast. So I just, I'm going to stick with the 
four point default. And I didn't mention this before, but there is a perspective as well. If you want to make this look like it is moving on a perspective to make this have a little bit more of a powerful effect. So feel free to add a perspective if you want to, I'm not going to do it for this video. But now that we are done with that, I'm going to do the last step, which is to convert the surface from wireframe to no shading. And this will allow us to go in and make the changes to give this thing some color. So that's the final step. And I'm now going to hit OK on my options menu here. And then with that selection tool still selected, I'm going to hold Alt on a PC or Option on a Mac, click and drag this down to duplicate it, just so we have our initial thing here still working. And this is still live type, so you can go and change it later on if you want to. So that's a cool bonus to working this way. But now what I'm going to do is select that selection tool. Once again, have my type selected that I want to work with. And then we need to go to Object, Expand Appearance, which will allow us to start working with this on a 3D level. And then what you're going to want to do is to right click or control click if you don't have a right click button and then ungroup, and then right click again or control click again and do ungroup one more time. And that'll make each and every unique surface on this particular object easy to click without needing to use the direct selection tool to select them. And this is the point too where having smart guides makes this really fast because when you highlight over a service, it's really easy to tell where it is. So what I like to do is to click on the top surface of each of these letters and then hold shift as I click multiple ones until I select the top surface of each of these letters. And once I have selected the very top surface of each of these letters, I'm going to hit control G on a PC or command G on a Mac to group them. Alternatively, you can right click or control click and then click group. Since these are already grouped, it's going to say ungroup now, but it would say group if you did it this way initially. And then it's just really easy to select this top surface. So from this point, we can go to the fill in the toolbar and change the fill to be a different color. I'll just do a really light pink. And then we can also add in a stroke by clicking on the stroke in that toolbar, double clicking it. And in this case, I'm actually going to go back really quick to my fill just to copy the hex code for this light pink color. So control C or command C to copy that once you highlight it. And then I'm going to go back to the stroke, paste that by hitting control V or command V on a Mac to bring up the initial color that I selected, which just makes it easier for me to very quickly find a deeper shade of that color as I go in here and do this. So I'm going to hit okay there, which now gives us a fill with a stroke. And this is how we essentially go in and color each of the different faces of this particular object. So now I'm going to select the sort of bevel that we have on the outsides of these letters. And I'm just clicking them with the selection tool while holding shift so I can click multiple surfaces at one time. And I'm using the smart guys to help me know where each of these individual surfaces is. I'm also going to do it on the bottom bevel that each of these letters have. So I just clicked on all those. I'm once again going to hit Control G on a PC or Command G on a Mac to group all these together. And then I'm gonna hit I on my keyboard to select the eyedropper tool. And I'm just gonna click on this top example that I've already colored in to give me a starting point for this color. And then it's up to me to decide how I want to color this in. So I'm just going to make this a little bit darker while still having a little bit of color saturation there. And I'm going to hit OK. And if you want to change the color of the stroke, totally up to you. If you want to do that, you can also do that at this particular point in time. And I also realized that I might want to do the exact same coloration on the inside of this O. So I'm just going to click that, hit I, and then click on this other one that I've already colored, this other bevel I've already colored. And then I'm going to click on that, click on that bevel and hit control G just to group all those together. And now I'm just going to do these final surfaces by clicking on them, holding shift and clicking through all of them and making sure I even get this tiny little sliver in there, which will be a pain. So I'll get the easy ones first, and then I'm going to hit control plus on a PC or command plus on a Mac to zoom in and then hold shift and click this final one and then hit control G on a PC or command G on a Mac to group them. And as you can see, when I group these together, it basically put them to the front which gave this a kind of strange look. I will fix that 
in just a second. But I'm just going to hit I on my keyboard to bring up that eyedropper tool once again. And then I'm going to click on the surface that I just did and then go back to the fill, double click that and select a darker color as my final color for this particular design. And to fix the fact that this decided to throw these in the front of all the other objects, I'm going to right click or control click if you don't have a right click button, go to arrange and from arrange you want to send it to back, which will make these objects the furthest in the back. And also it looks like there are some shapes that were essentially completely hidden because they were too far back to be seen. I'm just gonna click those with a selection tool and hit delete or backspace to remove them from the object as they aren't really serving any real purpose. And of course you can go in here and change the strokes for these to be different at any point in time if you wanna give this even more contrast, a little bit of a different look there. So up to you if you want to do that. And in the case of this center or this very bottom darker shape. I'm just going to double click on the fill to copy that hex code by hitting control C or command C, double click on the stroke and paste that in with control V or command V to make that the exact same color, which I think just makes this look slightly better. And then I'm also going to use that selection tool to click, hold and drag around the entire object and then click on stroke in the appearance window, which is part of your properties window. So when you click on stroke, in the corner option, I like to hit round join, which just gives all the individual corners a rounded edge. It prevents some kind of funkiness when it comes to how these individual edges look. And this is also where you can change the weight of the stroke so you can have no stroke at all. And then you can make it larger and larger from that particular point. So I'm going to make that too. And for some reason this made the corner go back to miter join. So I'm gonna click round join once again since it looks like some of the objects here might not have had a stroke to begin with, perhaps a hidden object I didn't see before. And you can also change the alignment of the stroke. By default, it's center, but you can also align the stroke to be on the inside of each individual shape or on the outside of each individual shape. If you leave it on the default of center, it tends to look the best without requiring any more work from you in terms of realigning these edges. So I'm just gonna use that default for this but feel free to do whatever you think looks the best. So now we have our starting point, which is essentially a finished object if this is what you are looking to create. But if you remember in my example, I also have some additional shapes sort of flying up. So if you want to replicate that look on yours as well, what you can do is just go into your object and then from here, you can just click on that top face that we did before using the selection tool, click and hold alt on your keyboard if you're on a PC or option if you're on a Mac, and then start dragging this up. And as you drag it up, hold shift, which will make it stay on a perfect vertical plane. It's doing a little bit of funky automatic rearranging there, but by default that should work pretty well. So I'm just going to move this up a teeny little bit here to start this upward effect. And I'm also going to change the fill from a light pink to a white color to more closely match the example. And also when you click on these, you can just use your keyboard up and down arrows to have a little bit more fine tune adjustment if you don't wanna use your mouse to do that. So I'm just gonna do that on this one right there. And then I'm also going to click on this again with that selection tool. And to give this a very slight drop shadow, I'm going to hit the FX button in the appearance section of the properties window. And this time I'm going to go to stylize and from stylize, I'm going to go to drop shadow. And this will bring up a menu for drop shadow. And if you wanna see what this looks like in real time, just make sure preview is selected. So for mode, you want that to be on multiply. For opacity, I have it on 12% right now. Essentially, the greater the number in the opacity section, the more apparent this is going to be. For X offset, if you built an example like mine, you probably want this to be zero, but this just moves it left and right on the X axis. So if you want your drop shadow to look a little bit different or off skew, you can do it that way. And Y offset is essentially how far down this goes on the Y axis. So two points will move it two points downward, but you can make this greater or smaller or even make it a negative number, which will raise it vertically. So I'm just gonna leave that on two point 
As far as blur goes, I don't want a blur on this, so I made it zero point, but the bigger the number there, the more blurry your drop shadow will look. So if you want a little bit more of a soft and realistic drop shadow, you can feel free to do that there. And on color, what I like to do is to use just a very dark shade of whatever color it is that you're overlapping on. When you use pure black, sometimes it can look a little bit harsh, which is why I prefer using a very dark version of that color, but up to you, or you can even use a completely different color to give this a different look. So once you have that looking the way you want it to, you can just hit okay, which will automatically apply that drop shadow to these. And if you wanna remove that drop shadow after you add it, you can just hit the garbage can in the appearance window. And if you want to adjust it, you can just click on that drop shadow in the appearance section, which will bring up your options again to go ahead and change. But for the last step here, what I'm going to do is just duplicate this up a couple times to replicate the example I made before. So I'm clicking with my selection tool while holding Alt on a PC or Option on a Mac. I'm dragging this vertically, which will do that. And then if I want to redo that move in exactly the same way to make a perfect duplication, hit Control D on a PC or Command D on a Mac, and this will go ahead and do that. So that's just an easy way to duplicate a move that you had previously done. And then what you can do if you want to duplicate this on the bottom as well is to click on the top one of these and then hold shift and click on the other ones that you made. And then I usually just click on the top one because it's easiest for me to see and work with. But with all those selected, I'm going to hold alt on a PC or option on a Mac to duplicate this. Click, hold and drag this down while holding shift and move these to the bottom of the letters there. And as you can see, it is to the front of the object, which isn't what we want. So I'm going to right click or control click if you don't have a right click button, arrange, and then send to back. And then while these are still selected, I can use my up and down keyboard arrows to adjust them however I see fit to create this effect. So that's really it for this video. This is a really cool effect that's a lot of fun to play with. And of course you can go in and play with all sorts of different angles and rotations and bevel types to make this really look the way that you want it to look. So I do hope you found this video to be helpful. And if you did, please hit the thumbs up button to let me know that it was helpful to you. And also if you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave those in the comments section. Maybe I can help you with any questions you have or someone else can do exactly the same thing. And if you want to see more videos like this in the future, please consider subscribing. I do my best to keep creating new content just like this. But that's really it for this video. Thank you so much for watching.